started here. So welcome everyone uh, in the classroom, welcome uh, in the Dharma Center, welcome everyone online. Um, thanks for coming again to Buddhism 101, uh, week two. So we got, uh, uh, after tonight, you only have two more left and whew, it'll be over. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I thought maybe today we just take a minute just to kind of, you know, again, uh, like we did last week, check in with our motivation. Uh, let's cultivate a good, positive motivation for being here today. Um, and, uh, you know, try to make it as expansive as possible. So not just to benefit ourselves are we here, but also to just learn a little bit more about Buddhism, learn a little bit more about what this thing called the Dharma is, so that, yes, it will help us, maybe it will help our own minds, maybe it will enrich us a little bit, but also maybe it will help us to uh, understand this life that we're living and uh, allow us to be able to be more beneficial than to others as well. So with that motivation, we'll just begin our, uh, our class tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and take a minute actually first to do a, just a quick um, mindfulness meditation. So just take a minute. We just had a, had a long day here at six o'clock. You know, we've uh, been busy out in the world doing all kinds of stuff. So let's come into our bodies, into our relaxed um, minds and just to the best of our ability just be present be relaxed let go of any tension or worry just come right here into the present moment Just do a quick body scan, bringing your awareness down through your body from the crown of your head. Just bringing it down gently, slowly, just melting down through your body. And just let it flow down all the way through, all the way down to the tips of your toes. And as it flows down, just imagine letting go of all tension, all stress, all worry. Just let your body completely relax while your mind remains fresh, present, and awake. So now if your eyes are closed, go ahead and open your eyes slowly. <clears throat> Bring your awareness again to the whole room. And let's go ahead and study a little bit of basic Buddhism. Talk about it a little bit. So, um, so last week was week one. So we talked a little bit about uh, the life of the Buddha. We talked about his life story and how his life story is kind of an example of his entire teaching and his entire purpose for uh, founding this, this tradition, this philosophy, uh, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, called Buddhism. So, <laughs> hey, how's it going? Cool. Right on. Hey, John. Good to see you. See you tomorrow. So we just had a, a visitor pop in here, uh, as you may know, uh, John Bruna. I've, I've heard uh, he's a little bit well known in these parts, so maybe you've uh, anyway, stopped by to say hello. <laughs> so yeah, so we talked a little bit about the Buddha's life. We talked a little bit about what the Buddha taught. Um, we got into that just a little bit. Again, this is, a, this is kind of a survey course. It's a really, all we're going to do is really just kind of touch on a lot of things that could require uh, days, weeks, 
months and possibly years of explanation and study and contemplation. And uh, definitely um, all of those things coming from someone who's much more knowledgeable than myself. So all we're going to do really for this course is just touch on little things that if you continue your study of Buddhism in the future, uh, they can be interesting in and of themselves just for touching on them for a minute. But if you do continue study, you will come across these things again and again. So things like the Four Noble Truths, things like uh, in our last week's handout, we had uh, a, a translation of the Heart Sutra. Uh, and we had a translation of uh, some other uh, scriptural teachings as well from the Buddha. So you're going to run into things um, over and over and over again. And you'll receive teachings from all kinds of people explaining these things from different angles, different points of view, and uh, in different ways. So, so pretty much all what I like about the teachings of, of Buddhism is that they go very deep. You know, they can be summed up in maybe a sentence or, or a short list of items or, or um, uh, you know, a couple of pithy little phrases, but then, you know, a really skilled scholarly um, uh, teacher, um, he or she can really go, get into depth and, you know, based on their own extensive study, listening to teachings and their own contemplation and practice, they're able to really get into this sort of nitty gritty, very meaty um, uh, explanation of, of what these things really mean and how they are very practical to us and how they go really to the core of our being. So that's what I really enjoy about Buddhism is how, how deep it goes. It just goes, it just really is very satisfying uh, on many, many levels. So, so yeah, so we talked a little bit about that and got that started. So uh, does anybody remember what the Four Noble Truths were generally or, or one of them? Uh, or? The origin of suffering. Uh-huh, yeah. Truth of suffering. Yeah, that's two of them. of suffering. Yeah. That's okay. Gotta okay. go to the source. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, yeah, so pretty, uh, I mean, like I say, that that is a teaching in and of itself that could go on for days. His Holiness the Dalai Lama regularly gives teachings on the Four Noble Truths. And it's not something that, you know, you just kind of go, yeah, you know, there's suffering, there's a cause for it, it can come to an end, and then there's a way out of it and just leave it at that. I mean, it really can get quite deep and quite involved and um, there can be a lot of detailed explanations and there can be a lot of meditation that you can do on that yourself over the course of not just five minutes or, or half an hour, but over really days, weeks, and uh, you know, whole retreats can be spent just contemplating these sorts of things so that, you, uh, so that the truth of it really does become a part of your experience. Um, so... So yeah, so we just touched on these things a little bit. So, um, but it's definitely the Four Noble Truths are really foundational, and I recommend that if you're interested in, in Buddhism at all and interested in taking it to another level, that you just keep keep your ear out for that particular teaching called the Four Noble Truths. Read some books on it. Uh, read, uh, listen to teachings by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, other reputable teachers as well, and. Uh, Contemplate it in your life. You know, is is it true? Is there is there suffering? Uh, is our existence conditioned by suffering? Um, what is the cause of that suffering? Well, Buddhism says that it's clinging and self grasping. Well, you know, think about that. Is that true? Is it possible that that is the cause for suffering? Is it possible that there is an end to suffering? There's a cessation to suffering. Okay, you know, maybe maybe there maybe there is maybe there's not. You know, so you have to look into that yourself. And then also, is there a path to suffering? And look at the, 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 the eightfold path it's called and you know judge for yourself is this something that is going to lead out of suffering or not or is it a possibility at least so 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 that's a little recap of last week uh, this week's main topic that I wanted to kind of broach was what Buddhists believe that's what I'm calling it so um, again this is a big topic that we won't be able to uh, you know even pay justice to in the in the course of an hour, uh, let alone breaking it down into the three ma three subtopics that I have here is it's completely absurd that I should even try to explain any of this within the course of an hour. But um, but yeah, to have all three of these, yeah, that's that's just that's laughable. But um, but we're gonna just touch like I say, we'll just touch on some of this stuff. What I want to talk about a little bit first is that word believe. Like, what does that mean when we say what do Buddhists believe? Because one of the, uh, again, one of the things that draw, drawn me to Buddhism uh, and kept me interested for so many years is that 
nothing is needs to be taken on faith in Buddhism. Not a blind faith, anyway. There's, there's different types of faith that you can cultivate, of course. Um, and sometimes you need to start out with a, a certain sense of like, hmm, I don't understand that yet, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give it the benefit of the, of the doubt, and I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, take a leap here and say a leap of faith and, and just kind of go along with that for now. But, but we don't have to just stop there. We don't have to just simply say, well, the Buddha said it, so it's true, and that's it, and no more investigation occurs. And we just quote scripture and sutras and da 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 and just do that you know ad nauseum for the rest of our lives and just memorize stuff and just spew it out that's not the point of buddhism it was never the buddha's intention to even really start a religion necessarily and um, one of the things that he's actually quoted as, as saying is uh, in fact just as gold as a goldsmith would test his gold by burning cutting and rubbing it so too must you examine my words and uh, and accept them, uh, not based upon your reverence for me. So he's very clear about that, and he says things like that quite often throughout the sutras, that you need to really, you know, not just repeat back what he said like a parrot, but if he choose says, yeah, choose, well, choose your own, but examine what he says. Is that true? You know, is what he says true? If he says, you know, if, for example, the truth of suffering, you know, uh, when he says like that, uh, our existence is characterized by suffering or unsatisfactoriness. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you could you could just just go with that and just say, OK, great. Sounds good. Um, but it's really not going to do you much good unless you examine your own life, your own experience um, and, and take a look around and see, like, is that actually true or not? Because, you, hey, maybe it's not true. You know, he's, he's very, very open to being challenged. Um, uh, the thing about Buddhism as well is that, you know, and, and about what the Buddha taught was he wasn't teaching something that he just made up. He was teaching things that he observed to be true in reality. So uh, when, he, when we talk about the, the Tibetan word for, um, uh, for the Dharma is, uh, is ch, which has a lot of different trans translatable uh, meanings to it, but one of them is just simply reality or how things are, you know, how things exist the way they are. So this is what he taught. He had this realization, like this is how reality is, this is the, this is the truth, um, and this is how we go about realizing the truth for ourselves. So, um, so when we say what do Buddhists believe, this is again, this is not something where we're talking about taking things on faith. Uh, regurgitating a bunch of uh, you know lines and scriptures and things like that, but it's really um, after listening to, thinking about, and then um, and then deeply understanding the teachings um, from our own experience. Then and only then do we say like yes, I I believe this, and so it's based really uh, upon our own experience. Okay, so. Uh, so there's a number of ways that we can approach this, what do Buddhists believe? So there's a, a group of teachings called the Four Seals, which is um, a very concise list of four things that are said to basically constitute whether or not we're talking about a Buddhist point of view or not. So um, these four things, again, um, is something that's going to be, we're just going to touch upon here. I've received teachings on the Four Seals that lasted for like three full days of like just nonstop you know, a little break for tea, a little break for lunch kind of thing by a very, very erudite scholar who was just amazing and a, and a realized practitioner as well. So again, we're just going to kind of touch on these things a little bit. But basically what, what, what I want us to get out of this is just, you know, a little taste of what the Four Seals is all about and uh, planting a couple of very important vocabulary words in our mind, things that are quintessentially Buddhist, you know. So when we think about Buddhism, from now on, we want to like kind of think about these four seals and go like, okay, so what are the four seals again? And oh yeah, it's you know impermanence, it's you know unsatisfactoriness, emptiness, and nirvana. So those those kind of four things. And then we can kind of mull over those, you know, again and again and again and again, and read about them again and again, and listen to teachings about them again and again. But basically, the four seals are this. So the first one is. Now, I crossed out the, a couple of words there, so if you want to grab a pen and, re and write in a different word, um, you're, you don't have to, but I just kind of was rereading it and thinking that, um, that maybe the word conditioned wasn't um, the best word. 
And so uh, a lot of translators will use the word compounded or composite. So all compounded or composite phenomena or things are impermanent. All right. So this is a basic Buddhist tenet, this idea, and this is, uh, this is to be found within the First Noble Truth, um, actually, as well. So he talks a little bit about um, uh, you know, the truth of suffering, or maybe it's in more in the, in the Second Noble Truth, the, the cause of suffering. But one of the things that we tend to do as you know, corporate sentient beings is we make this assumption that things are not impermanent. We may intellectually know, and when somebody stops us and says, you know, well, if everything's impermanent, we're like, oh yeah, of course it is. But when we stop and we examine actually how we interact with the world and how we interact uh, and how we live our lives and how we make decisions and how we plan things, we don't really think about impermanence ever. <laughs> um, we pretty much all the time make the assumption that not only are phenomena have some sort of permanence to them, like they're always going to be there, but we also think that we're, imperm we're permanent as well. And we base all of our, you know, our decision making on this assumption. Um, we do all kinds of planning. We do all kinds of um, decision making um, based on this idea that I'm always going to be here. I'm here right now. I've always been this way. I'm never going to change. I want this right now, so I'm going to get it. I'm going to get this thing that's never changing, and it's going to make me happy. So um, this is a really, really important point, a really, really fundamental thing that the Buddha observed, is that we sentient beings, we, we corporate beings, we uh, beings who are convinced of our own existence, suffer greatly because of the fact that we don't make our decisions, that we don't live our lives understanding deeply the impermanence of everything. We, um, and we go through life this way. We go through our whole lives without ever really ever thinking about it. You know, and again, somebody says like, hey, don't worry about it, it'll pass, it's impermanent. And then we're like, yeah, absolutely, yeah, it's totally impermanent. And then, like, and then we forget about it almost in the next second, you know, and then we're right back to believing that I'm here, I'm permanent, I'm never going to change. The, you know, this thing that I'm, I'm after is, is also permanent and has these inherent qualities that are never going to change. And then we just go right back into, into this, this habitual pattern of that's how we relate to the world, that's how we relate to phenomena, that's how we relate to ourselves. So the truths are the hardest to learn sometimes. Yeah, exactly. It's so subtle. It's so subtle and it's so obvious and it's so easy to understand. And yet at the same time, it's really, it, it's not, it's not, we don't, we actually fundamentally reject it, you know, at our being, at the core of our being. We're like, no, <laughs> I am never going to die. You know, this is sort of like, this is how we think, you know. So, um, so this is, this is a, a key, key foundational idea in Buddhism all compounded, all composite phenomena, and that means everything from cell phones to malas to uh, puppy dogs to, uh, uh, to cars to ideas to emotions are all impermanent. They're all, in a, actually not just impermanent in the sense that, you know, one, you know, maybe last year, maybe like Mount Sophros we think is, is like pretty much like not changing except in like some grand scale geological time, but really someone who's like ultimate, you know, intimately familiar with it may have a different view, actually, that it's continuously changing every single moment of every single day. So this is the kind of impermanence that we're talking about, something that's all pervasive. There's not even a minute where things are stable. There's not even a, a millisecond. Go down to the, what I don't know, what's the, what's the, the smallest division of Particle time? Of Particle of a second, whatever, whatever. Uh, you know, there's not, there's no permanence anywhere to be found anywhere. We're constantly in a state of flux, and we can do we can do meditations on this, and it's encouraged. Again, this is this comes down to us uh, not just accepting this as being uh, a statement of truth, but something that we need to experience for ourselves. And the way we need to experience it for ourselves is by 
analyzing it with our meditation, through our meditation. So the first thing we do with meditation is we settle the mind, we calm down, we learn how to focus our minds, and this can take a long time, of course. But then, you know, when we have some sort of focus and stability, then we can put our minds to things like this, and we can say, okay, is this true? Is there anything... Let's just take my, my body, you know? And so you go and you settle your mind down and you start going through your body and you're like, is there any part of my body that is unchanging? That even for a moment doesn't, isn't in a state of flux. And so when we go through and we can just kind of think, it's like, no, I mean, that's, you know, we know that it's like our, our skin cells of our body are continuously falling off of us. Our, skill, our cells are, are continuously uh, regenerating, dying and, and coming into being. Our blood is flowing through our body, moving all the time. We're, you know, one minute we weigh one, you know, number of pounds or kilograms, and the next minute we weigh another because of, you know, taking in food and eliminating water and food and waste. Um, I mean, it's just, it's a, conti in a continuous state of flux. So even our own body, and we do this with this meditation, we go, through it, we imagine our breath coming in and going out, that's never permanent. And then slowly, 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 after doing this for many, many sessions, many, many meditation sessions, um, we can gain some certainty that, no, my body is impermanent, completely impermanent. I don't, I don't have the same body that I had yesterday, let alone 10 years ago, right? <laughs> let alone 25 years ago. So, um, and yet, even, even then, even after meditating on it again and again and again, maybe for many years, we're still just like, yeah, give me that ice cream, or, you know, just, you know, I'm going to live forever, you know, this kind of attitude, like, I'm always going to be here, so I got plenty of time to watch TV, to do whatever I need, you know, whatever's going to make me, you know, happy for a moment. So, um, so yeah, so this is, uh, this is, again, this is a foundational concept of Buddhism, and it's one that we can meditate on. Uh, on a regular basis and, and it's encouraged that we do meditate on this and we make it something that we, we make a part of ourselves, a part of our understanding of, of reality. So um, so the next one, the second of, of the four seals is all, um, as some of you online might have all polluted phenomena or the nature of being unsatisfactory, but uh, there's another term that we can use, we could say contaminated. And um, contaminated by what? Contaminated by our um, confusion, our delusion, our afflictive emotions, our perceptions, our, our, our uh, deluded perceptions. So that's what, so phenomena that are like, for example, um, my iPhone 6, which now I just found out the other day, I can upgrade to an iPhone 7. So, um, so my deluded perception a year ago was that like, yes, I'm going to get an iPhone 6 and it's going to be great and it's going to make me happy. And, <laughs> and I'm finally going to be cool because I've got a real like of a brand new updated iPhone, you know. And so I got it and I really enjoyed it for a, a long time. And, um, but then the iPhone 7 came out just a couple months later and I couldn't get an upgrade on it until this year. So I had like nine long months of just, you know, desperate waiting, you know, like just trying to pretend to myself that I was okay with the iPhone 6, of course, but, uh, <laughs> but, but just in my heart of hearts, just going like, I wish I had a 7. So... <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, I mean, it's like, yeah, anyway, fill in the blank. Still rocking the 5. Wait, you're still rocking the 5? That's cool. I rocked the 4. The as well, so I, 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 rocked, I rocked the 4 for a long time. I was mm -hmm. very... I actually had a flip phone for a while. Pretty cool. Smartphone. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so what's going on there? What's going on with that? So, um, so according to this, so this is this is a phenomenon. It's a it's a thing, and I have I have put all of this conceptual junk on it. Right. I have made all these assumptions about it. I've said you know that this is a useful thing. I've said that it's cool because it's new. I've, uh, I've labeled it with, uh, you know, I need this because of my, you know, it's got my Tibetan dictionary on it and it'll just be able to, it'll be even that much better when I've got an even better Tibetan dictionary on there. Um, I'll be able to store more, you know, whatever. 
mm-hmm. audio and movies and you know da 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 you know all this sort of stuff. But I'm labeling it with all of these concepts and these ideas about it being good and about it. You know, if I have it, if I if I bring it to myself, if I can hold it and keep it in my life, it will somehow satisfy me. It will somehow make me happy. But what happens is like immediately after you get something, whatever it is, whether it's a new car or the new iPhone or the, or the, uh, or you, you know, you get into that, why am I getting to that comfortable position on the couch or whatever it is, whatever, whatever you've desired, once you get it, immediately it changes. And because our projections onto it and our conceptual ideas about it are actually not really true, there's no weight or substance to it then ultimately it becomes a novelty. Ultimately, it is unsatisfactory. Completely okay. fictionalizing ourselves. Mm. Yeah, exa- exactly, exactly. And, and, to, and, to, and it's not going to be, this, this iPhone 6 or 7 or whatever it is, is not going to have the same award to everybody. There's plenty of people who are like, smartphones, fart phones, whatever. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, no, that's mm-hmm. just, you're, you're ridiculous for, for being intro- into that. And yet... <laughs> They've got their thing, I guarantee you. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> Everyone? <laughs> one friend with the still holding on to the flip phone. Right, right, right. <laughs> or maybe they're just simply attached to the idea that smartphones are a waste of time, and right. that's the thing that makes them happy, feeling like, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm happy without that technology, and that makes me just a little bit better than, than other people, you know? So, but they're wrong. Right, but they're, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. <Those laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so, so yeah, so all phenomena are, um, you know, for one thing, we're labeling the heck out of them with these erroneous, you know, labels. And because they're impermanent as well, they ultimately are unsatisfactory. Okay, so that's the second of the four seals. And this is also a very, very useful thing to sit down and think about and contemplate and meditate on and, and think about things in, in this way, you know. Has there ever been a thing that has given me ultimate satisfaction? Anything at all, whether it's an activity, whether it's a material of an object, whether it's a state of mind that's you know that's a, an impermanent state of mind, an accomplishment. an accomplishment. You know, we accomplish things and then you know and then immediately the we're off to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. We're just like, okay, let's go ahead and make, what's the next thing I'm going to conquer. Um, not to say that there's anything inherently wrong with getting things that we want and accomplishing things and things like that. We're not saying that. What we're saying is they're ultimately unsatisfactory. And what Buddhism is trying to address is how do we become ultimately happy? How do we become ultimately free of this round and round and round of samsara, of birth, cyclic birth and death and you know, this trap that we're in? Permanently free. Well, there, there, it's uh, it's a little tricky. There is a thing called in in you know Buddhist teachings called great permanence, but this is something that is kind of a little bit counterintuitive, and it's really non-conceptual, and it's something that goes beyond ideas about you know past, present, future, long periods of time, or anything like that. It's not about it's you know once it's it's about like ultimate realization, which is we're going to talk about in the last one, Nirvana. Okay, so. So the, the third one, just going to touch on real briefly because the third one is a little bit difficult to explain even if you know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, um, and I don't, and I, this is one that is going to be something that if, you're, if you get into the Dharma, if you get into Buddhism, you're going to be studying this topic ad nauseum for the rest of your life until you attain the, the fourth, uh, until you get to the fourth step here. So, uh, so the, th- the third one says all phenomena are empty of self, okay? So this, mm, this again ties into these assumptions that we have about things. We uh, tend to have this idea very firmly ingrained in us where we believe that beginning with ourselves, we exist in some independent way. Not only are, do we believe that we're permanent, but we exist in some way that is, you know, that when we say like I, or we say my, 
we have this, if you don't examine it very closely, we have this very strong sense that there is a, some kind of nucleus of me that's really there that has no relationship to anything else that is completely separate from all other things that exists in and of itself. So, and we feel this very, very strongly. And um, I mean, just think about how you feel when somebody takes something of yours that you're very strongly attached to, or somebody punches you in the arm, or somebody calls you a name, or cuts you off in traffic, you know, or something like that, or does like whatever it is that you can think of that, that brings up that sen that very strong sense of like, how dare you do that to me, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so we've all been there, and we all go there a lot. So there's that, there's this sense, you know, at the core of our being that there's something there, there's something that exists, there's something that is really truly me. And there's also an assumption too that in the things that we perceive outside of us, there's also something there as well whether it's a cup or a table or, or a you know, mother or a lover or a pet or um, whatever object or whatever it is, we make this assumption that there's a me and there's an other. And these things are not connected in any way or not dependent upon anything but themselves. All right. So what the Buddha realized is that that's completely false. That's completely not how things exist at all, actually. That there's no independently existing anything, in fact. That upon examination, anything that we look at, um, if we start breaking it down into its com component parts, the parts that it depends upon to be that thing are really actually limitless. If you really go like go for it and really just say, okay, I'm just gonna like figure, what is this cup here? And I don't care how long it takes. I'm gonna see like what is it, what it, all the parts and the causes and the conditions and everything that needs to be be in order for this cup to be here. And if you really go and you really look at it and you really examine it and you really keep your mind open and you've got a fair amount of you know life experience, you could really like see thousands and thousands of, of causes and conditions for this cup. So, I mean, there's the shape of it. There's the size of it. There's the fact that it holds water. There's the color of it. You know, it, there's the fact that it's a nice cup. You know, it looks kind of nice, you know. There's all these labels that we put on it. There's all these causes and conditions that needed to come into be. There's um, it, the people who made the cup, it. the transportation. Exactly, exactly. So all these things, there's the fact that I'm a human being. This is only a cup based upon my, my hum, our humanness and the fact that we can use this cup. to. An, it's not a cup to an ant. I mean, there's no, <coughs> an ant doesn't look at it as a cup. It's just something to maybe go in and check out and see if there's anything useful in there. And, or it's just an obstacle to get around, you know? So, so where then is the cupness? Where is the cup that's just a cup, you know? So anyway, so the so the the, the punchline is that there isn't any cup, but then there then there is. <laughs> sure there is yeah. <laughs> so um, so anyway, so what is said about the cup is the way the cup actually exists is it is exists in a state of what's called emptiness, not non-existence, but emptiness and emptiness of what emptiness of inherent existence or independent existence, okay. Um, and in fact, it's said that when you're when talking about emptiness, emptiness and interdependence are actually interchangeable. They're the, really the same thing. So when we say emptiness, what we mean is interdependent arising or interdependent existence. When we say interdependent existence, what we actually mean is emptiness. Okay. So that's a very, very brief, very, very um, probably unsatisfactory <laughs> explanation of what emptiness is. But... Um, but again, this is something that we need to study, read about, listen to teachings about, contemplate, meditate on again and again and again and again to really have an understanding of, okay? So, so there's those three things. 
And these sort of three things are, uh, are sort of the foundational Buddhist beliefs that lead us to the, the, the final of the four seals here, which is nirvana is peace. So basically realizing all of these things, all of those three first things, and realizing them to the point where there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever. Like there is not even a shred of expectation that things are permanent. There's not even uh, a shred that like something outside of ourselves can be satisfactory. Uh, and there's not even a shred of doubt that things exist inter interdependently and are empty of inherent existence. When those things are truly realized, that's what nirvana is. Okay, but as we can see from practicing for um, 10 years or 15 years or 20 years or 30 years and doing retreat and doing meditation and doing study and all this sort of stuff, it's not as easy as it sounds to realize these things. We can understand these things intellectually, you know, without too much effort. They might be a little bit challenging at times. So intellectually, we can understand these things, but in terms of, you know, really tilling it into our, our minds so that there is a, what, what we say, what we call realization um, is much more difficult. So, but once that realization occurs, once that realization is truly dawned in our minds and true, under, true understanding and deep understanding has occurred, then that's what's called nirvana. So it's, and we talked about in what the Buddha said when he attained enlightenment, which he kind of sat there and he said, ah, you know, I'm not going to be fooled no more. <laughs> you know, so there's, it, after that point, he was never, ever, ever tricked again by, this, by these notions of like, I truly exist, I'm permanent, other things are permanent, these sorts of things. So, so, so that's the four seals in a nutshell. Um, I want to just touch a little bit on these next two things here without going into as much detail, but I do want to touch on them real quickly here because I want to leave a little bit of time for question and answer too and, and just some, some talk. So, um, so when we talk about unsatisfactoriness or suffering, um, sometimes the word suffering isn't such isn't like the, the greatest word. I think we, we talked about that a little bit last week and that maybe uh, unsatisfactoriness is a better word. Because when the Buddha said all you know existence is or conditioned existence is suffering, immediately people can raise their hand and say, "Yeah, but I got it pretty good. I mean, you know, I don't suffer all the time. I mean, I'm pretty happy most of the time. I'm a, I got almost everything I need. I'm sad, you know, more or less, you know, doing okay. You know, more or less feeling content." But what, what we're talking about here is not just gross suffering, but we're talking about different levels of, of suffering, different levels of unsatisfactoriness, okay? So there's three basic ways in which suffering or unsatisfactoriness is uh, broken down. So the first one is the suffering of suffering. So this is just the gross suffering. You get the flu, um, uh, you know, we get old, we're all going to die, uh, that sort of thing, a pain. Uh, of, of any kind. This is, this is gross suffering, and it's stuff that we experience not continuously, but we experience at different points in our lives, and we're all going to experience it, okay? So when people say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I, I only experience gross suffering once in a while, it's like, yeah, yeah that's true, but you are going to experience it. <laughs> at the very least, you got to give me that, no right? <laughs> There's no getting around it at some point. You know, at the very least, even if you just live an absolutely perfect, healthy, super you know, content life, you're going to die at the end, okay? So, you know, so, you know, come on, nobody all right? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, nobody, nobody gets out of, nobody here gets out of life. Unfortunately. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, well, I don't know, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> like, who is, like, yeah, where's, who's, who's the self is dying? Anyway, all right. Um, okay, so the second type of suffering or unsatisfactoriness is the suffering of change, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is a little bit more subtle. This one is a little bit harder sometimes to recognize or to appreciate. It might be sort of like that sort of that piece of popcorn husk that's like stuck in your, in your gum, between your gum and your teeth that you're like, you know it's there and it's kind of bugging you, but you, you, you can kind of tune it out for a little while. But, um, but the suffering of change is something that we're always experiencing. You know, it's like it's getting the, the new iPhone 
and being like, yes, I finally have it all. And then like, and then you drop it and it, your screen shatters and you've got that spider web on your screen. You're like, ugh, you know? That's gross stuff. Ugh. Sure. What? That's gross stuff. That's, that is gross suffering, but it is a case for it. Right, right, exactly. Get that outer box. But um, but what else? Like, you know, like sitting on the couch you know, after a hard day's work and you've been like sitting at a desk all day or you've been doing your whatever you do all day and then you finally get home and you're like, you've been thinking about it and you finally get there and you're like, yes. And you got your cup of tea and you got your snack or whatever and, and you're just like, yes, I'm here. And then you're like, ow, oh, ah, I gotta, you gotta move, you know? And, oh, okay, there it is, there it is, okay, yeah, there it is. Then you just notice it. And then, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or getting to that perfect temperature, you know? It's like, yes, finally, it's 71.7 degrees and it's just perfect. And then you get that little draft that comes in, you know? So it's things like that. So the suffering of change, and it, we're constantly experiencing it. We're never really truly satisfied. Mm -hmm. Even if we can say, hey, I got that job, you know, I have a, the perfect job, the perfect, you know, spouse, partner, family, whatever. I mean, come on, come on. It's all changing. It's all going through like this, this flux of satisfactoriness or, or non-satisfactoriness, okay? So, and then the third one is even more subtle. So it's called the, uh, the all-pervasive suffering of conditioned existence. So no matter what we're experiencing while in samsara, whether it seems good, bad, or neutral, due to the fact we are engaged always in subject-opposite grasping, we are always creating the causes for future suffering. So this one is very, a, little more, a lot more subtle, and it's, we need to do a little more examination of that in our lives. Definitely the first two we can definitely probably see pretty readily. And if we meditate on those two, we're going to go a long way to sort of accepting the fact that life as we experience it and engage in it is unsatisfactory. But this one here has to do also with the fact that we're just kind of going through life um, in an uncontrolled, out of control kind of way. You know, we're, we're just at, kind of at the mercy of our karma. We're at the mercy, maybe that's not, that's not a, a good word to use. We're at the mercy of our uh, afflictive emotions, our, our ignorance, our misunderstanding. And it seems like we're always made to go and work through it. Right, exactly, exactly. So, so that's, that's what that's all about. And this has to do a little bit too with like past and future lives as well, which again is something that you, know, you have to examine yourself and decide whether or not that's, that works for you or not. But, um, but bas this is basically saying that as long as we're not trying to get out of samsara, we're stuck in samsara and ultimately you know, no matter how good things get, it's still samsara, and it's and and we're just we're kind of stuck here. So, all right. So that's the three types of suffering. Okay, and so this is again falls into the broad heading of like what do Buddhists believe? And again, we don't just believe them, but we examine them and we try to try to you know come to some conclusions based on our own experience and our own contemplation. Okay. So, having having come to some sort of conclusions about these things, then we have some choices. We can either say, okay, well, maybe that, all that's true, but there's nothing I can do about it. Um, or we can say, yeah, all that's true, but, uh, but the Buddhist did say that there was some things that we can do about it. So what do I do? So all of these things, all of these conceptual uh, ideas we have about things existing, about things being permanent, about relating to things in that way, uh, about being caught up in our suffering, about being kind of trapped by it uh, in a way. Um, essentially what we're doing in that sort of ignorant, um, trapped state of mind is that we're, um, we're going for refuge in sort of the wrong things. We're going, f like I'm looking for happiness in an iPhone or in a... Uh, pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream, which I still hope, I just hope, that I, I, I think there might be a little happiness in there, but uh, <laughs> I know, I know, it's great. So, um, <laughs> so, um, so we're going for refuge in the wrong things, okay? So going for refuge is a big 
deal in Buddhism. And it's sort of like this, uh, it's sort of like that thing that sort of like makes you a Buddhist once you decide like, I'm, you know what, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this on. You know, I've, I've tried it out. I've, I've given it a whirl with a little bit of examination. But now, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty convinced. I've done some meditation. I've done some contemplation. I've listened to some teachings. I've developed a little bit of certainty, maybe not total certainty, but a little bit. So now, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a little bit of a commitment here. And instead of going for refuge in all these things that are you know, ultimately unsatisfactory, I'm going to go for refuge in something that can lead to liberation, ultimate happiness. Um, yeah, liberation from what we call samsara, the endless wheel of, of birth and death and just, just being stuck, you know. So, um, so again, you know, this is based upon our own sort of uh, uh, examination and, um, and the conclusions we've drawn. But we decide, yeah, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a try here. So I'm going to go for refuge in something else and something that's maybe I can, I can maybe say is even infallible, you know, something I can definitely trust, okay? So the three things, there are three things that we go to refuge for when we, like, quote unquote, become a Buddhist. Um, so that's the Buddha, that's the Dharma, and that's what's called the Sangha. So there's, three, there's th these three things. And these three things are kind of like transcendent objects. They're not, um, in a way they're conceptual, but in a way they're just, they're beyond concepts. They're beyond our normal view of what it is that we go for refuge in or that we take as being a guide and things like that. What we're actually taking uh, refuge in, what we're actually taking as our guide is the, is the truth that the Buddha discovered, that the Buddha observed, okay? But these things are embodied because we're still conceptual beings and we're dualistic beings and we look at you know, things from a subject object point of view. We need these sort of uh, things to put in front of us that we can kind of look towards, bring our mind towards and help us to focus our minds in the right direction, okay? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, um, again, the, the truth that the Buddha understood is non-conceptual. But how do you explain non-conceptuality to somebody who is conceptual and stuck in concepts? You know, you can't. So you have to use concepts in order to get to, the, you know, this sort of absolute, right? Uh, or this non-conceptual state of mind, all right? So, so that's kind of what this, the, these things are. So we've got the Buddha. Now, this can refer to the historical Buddha, but it can also refer to the, um, uh, the, uh, the omniscient mind of the Buddha, or it can refer also to our own Buddha nature, which is innate within each and every one of us. So we're when we take refuge in the Buddha, we actually we are looking towards, the, towards this tanka here, this picture, and we're saying, yes, there was this being who was this historical being who came, who walked this path, who did the meditation, who had the realization, who then taught the path, who, um, who was completely focused and completely dedicated to doing this. And that is our true refuge. That's somebody that we can really put our faith in. Even though that person has long since passed away, it is still, there's the example of his life story, there's the example of um, you know, how he went about finding the truth for himself that we can look at and we can say like, yeah, that's a good example. I can follow that. And if I follow that, then I will also myself attain some sort of lasting happiness, some sort of lasting realization, okay? The Dharma, these are the words of the Buddha, what the Buddha taught, and these can be represented by texts, they can be represented by the speech of, uh, of various teachers, the speech of the, of the Buddha, of course, we can't hear anymore, but we can through the lineage of teachers that exist today who have received from direct transition, from direct transmission from teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student, all the way from directly from Shakyamuni Buddha. Okay, so, so this is, again, this is something else that we can take refuge in, but not until we've examined them. You know, we need to examine these things first and we need to decide for ourselves, does this stuff make sense, okay? Then the refuge becomes really deep and meaningful. And then there's the Sangha. So we use the word Sangha a lot in, uh, in, in Buddhism and uh, especially in America and in Western, you know, European culture and stuff like that. We throw the word Sangha around to mean just, hey, any group, uh, like we're Sangha. You know, we, we can say that because we're, 
Uh, we were in this Dharma center. We were studying the Buddha, the Buddhist teachings together, and so we consider ourselves to be a spiritual community. But sangha, in this term, in, in terms of the, one of the three jewels of refuge, it goes a, quite a bit deeper than that. And so, you, when we're taking refuge, we're not taking refuge in each other because we're all deluded and and confused. So it's not a good idea. It's the blind leading the blind. So we don't want to do that. What we're talking about in the sangha is the enlightened sangha. Okay, the group of beings who have taken refuge in the Buddha, have listened to and put into practice his teachings, and have realized them for themselves. Okay, so these are the people who have attained liberation for themselves. How do you determine whether or not somebody has or not? Well, you got to examine you know, each person carefully, but it's really anyone since the Buddha's time until now who um, can be shown to be someone who is called an arhat or a realized being, someone who really has taken all these things to heart, realized them without any doubt. What was and then, called? what's that? What was that called? The Sangha? No, the Arhat. The arhat. Arhat. Okay. arhat, yeah. So that's a. a yeah, a realized being, someone who's like who's attained the same realization as the Buddha. Okay. All right. So um, yeah, so those are the three jewels. So um, again, we have to examine these things for ourselves before we take refuge, or we can just take refuge if we feel a calling to. It's totally fine to do that too. I'm not, a lot of people do that. They're just like some sort of karmic, you know feeling or, or whatever they just feel like yeah i'm gonna become a buddhist oh my god i have to do it and you know the dalai lama is giving refuge right now so i'm gonna do it or whatever and and that's okay but that doesn't mean that after you've taken refuge you don't consent continue your examination your study and your practice okay so um so anyway so yeah so there is a formal refuge ceremony that you can take too if you're if you're ever interested in doing something like that but you know it's got every person needs to make it make that decision for him or herself what they're gonna do so okay so so that is it for um, today's formal part of the class. Does uh, anybody have any questions about anything uh, from today or from last week? Or <laughs> what? Okay. All right. Cool. Where can you go for a formal refuge ceremony? It needs to be from uh, from an ordained person or from someone who's a recognized teacher. So, um, so that, and yeah, so that can be something you have to kind of seek out. So, but a lot of teachers like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, if there's big teachers that are coming in, um, Pema Chodron, uh, Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo, people like that often give, um, give, you know, the refuge ceremony. Um, so at the end of teachings and things like that, but you need to request, you need to request it from them. So. Um, and if you're interested, we can we can look at it and we can see if uh, you know what what opportunities are out there in in Colorado and stuff like that. So yeah, but the main thing it needs to be someone reliable. You know, it needs to be someone who's you know that, that that's holding some sort of precepts or vows themselves and and can bestow that you know onto you. So. And that's okay. That's okay. I mean, it's not like a 100% uh, requirement that if you even want to, you know, take refuge and consider yourself to be a Buddhist and things like that, you, that you have to believe in reincarnation. It's certainly not. Um, it's like a pretty big kitchen concept. 
I mean, it is a little bit. I mean, for some people, it's not though. You know, some people are like, no, I just don't believe in it. It's just not true, and and that, that's it. And then and then Buddhism still is a very very important part of their lives, and the teachings are very rich and meaningful and helpful. Um, so anyway, so but to, to you know, if you're a little bit on the fence on it though. And you're just not sure, and it's like, so what do you do to examine it a little bit more to make it a little bit more concrete? Um, I mean, yeah, maybe read a couple books on a couple more books on reincarnation, and look at the anecdotal evidence that out that's out there, not just the anecdotal, but also the, you know the, some studies that have been done as well. Um, keeping in mind that you know the scientific community doesn't want to have anything to do with with it, so that the you know those studies are a little bit limited, but. But there are there have been people out there who've tried to look at it from a you know uh, using the scientific method and things like that. So there's that, um, which is helpful. There is um, observation too. Well, let's actually let's let's leave that one for last. So then there's um, so what we have to look at what is it then that's being. I have to ask the question, what is it then is being, if there is reincarnation, what's being reincarnated, okay? It's not our bodies, obviously, because our bodies are going to die and, you know, decay and, uh, and, and they're just continuously changing anyway. Right, so it would be then something more immaterial, something a little more subtle, something metaphysical. So what we're talking about in Buddhist terms is that what is reincarnating is a very subtle level of consciousness, which is characterized by our karma and afflictive emotions, okay, our habitual tendencies, okay? So... But let's just stick with consciousness, a subtle level of consciousness, okay? One that um, goes beneath the, uh, this idea of this solid sense of me and who I am. Like, I'm Chris, you know, and I have these qualities and these likes and dislikes and this personal history. It's separate from ego. It's, separate, it's a little bit separate from ego, right? So, so when we look at that consciousness, um, the Holy, His Holiness the Dalai Lama can explain it much better than I can, and many other teachers can explain it much better than I can. But basically, we have to look at um, what is so everything, all phenomena have causes and conditions. Nothing just arises out of itself. We, we've kind of looked at that in, in the four seals here. So everything is dependent upon something else. So, um, so physical things have physical causes and conditions okay so that would mean that a non-physical thing like consciousness cannot be produced by or cannot have causes and conditions that are physical all right it has to have something non-physical that is that it arises out of and so what is that what is the, what it, you know what is the basic unit of consciousness well it's a moment of consciousness so what's the cause of that moment of particular moment of consciousness, it's the previous moment of consciousness. And it's the only thing that it can arise from. It doesn't really, it can't arise from, you know, uh, a volcano. It can't arise from, you know, uh, somebody writing it down. Or it can't arise from a seed, you know, a physical seed, anything like that. I mean, it comes from its directly preceding moment of consciousness. And so when we examine if we take, if we can, if we can get to that, then we say, like, okay, so that moment of consciousness, what was its cause? Well, the previous moment of consciousness was its cause, and then we go, okay, so that that one goes back three moments of consciousness. Okay, so then what is the cause of that one? It's like, well, it's the the one just preceding that. You know, was the was the gave rise to that next moment of consciousness, and we just kind of take that line of reasoning all the way back to the moment of conception. Never-ending cycle. Right. And so, so based upon that logic, if we accept that logic as being sound, then at that moment of conception where we've got sperm and egg coming together, there, um, there's consciousness all, you know, I mean, like was there some point during the, the stage of the embryo and the fetus and all this sort of developing where there was just simply no consciousness that the, 
that the the, emb the the fetus gave rise to consciousness? I mean, according to our logic, no, it can't can't have been. So so we take this all the way back then to the moment of conception, and then so we have to say like, okay, so before conception, then what you know what gave rise to that moment of consciousness at the moment of conception? Well, a previous <coughs> moment of consciousness, and then ex the the previous moment of consciousness. <laughs> And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way back to the, I mean, it has no beginning. This consciousness has no beginning. So, so that's one way to look at it. Okay. And that was a mind bender. And it's, I mean, to me, I'm still working on that, um, that one, but that's how it's traditionally explained. And, uh, it's becoming more satisfying to me, but I've had to do a lot of like, ah, what does that mean? <laughs> And uh, it's it just it's becoming a little more clear, but like I say, it's still a little bit difficult. So another another thing though is to just kind of look around at different people, and dogs and cats and sentient beings, and, and get to know, you know the people that you know intimately, the beings that you know intimately, and just kind of look at them and just go like, they're all really unique, you know, and not all of them are the way they are just because of the experiences they've had in this one lifetime. You know, that it doesn't explain things. You know, when you have someone, for example, who's just like picks up and, and goes and runs off to India to go in a, okay. live in a cave, you know, <laughs> or, um, or you've got two puppies that are, you know, as they grow up, they have two distinct different personalities, you know, even though they're supposedly just, you know, kind of meat machines, you know, that according to the scientific view, and they're just, you know, a product of, of uh, biology, you know. And they're just DNA and an instinct. Uh, no, yeah, it's just not not it's not what we observe. You know, it's a nice theory. It'd be nice if it was just all written neat and wrapped up like that, and you could be a nice little, you know, emotional scientist. But it's not that way. You know, the same for ourselves. You know, we all have different leanings. We can have twins come out. You know, identical genetic twins or completely different personalities, completely different interests, completely different uh, ways that they react to, to things. Um, you know, you got siblings who come out of uh, abusive home life situations. One of them becomes a junkie, the other one becomes a, you know, a, a entrepreneur, you know. I mean, two exact, you know, people coming out of the same situation, but they just, they just deal with things differently. Perspectives. Different perspectives. So that's what, another way you can look at things too, just the uniqueness of each expression of, of, of being. Um, and that's, you can at least posit that that comes from past life experiences and habitual tendencies, so. But ultimately you have to decide for yourself. Nobody can say because it, it is it's an unseen phenomenon basically you know now the Tibetan lamas all say you know especially the the Rinpoches the reincarnation reincarnated tukus they're called the emanation bodies um, are just like no it's not an unseen phenomena we every single lifetime we go through the process of death and and disintegration and then rebirth you know and you just you just don't remember it. <laughs> And it's just because of the fact that our memory is is, uh, is fallible. You know, it's like, what did you have for lunch? Um, Tuesday, March 11th, 2012. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but most people can't. A few eidetic memory peaks, but not that. Yeah, not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. It's just like memory peaks. And we have all this, and we can have all these life built up, and then we die. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah. As a kid. Well, because it's, I mean, I mean, I can. It's a moment that a kid, you know, arrives at some of the previous, previous moment of consciousness, things that we have carried. Yeah, there's some lapse. It's said that we do. At least some of the, you know. It's said that we do. And that's what I'm saying. Like, when you. Consciously, we might, but not remember it. It's kind of weird. Like, maybe it's in a way that something that we would just do. Yeah, exactly. So you have to go and relearn. Time to forget. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And the death process from the previous life is a traumatic experience. Going through the period 
between death and the next rebirth is a traumatic experience, it said. It's very, very um, confusing. It can, be v it can be very disorienting um, so that it just completely wipes out any memory of your past life, you know, within a few days, like we were just. You might still have it, but you don't remember it. Yeah, yeah. But um, what happens is, is that these subtle imprints and these karmic imprints and these tendencies that we have do stay in in the mind stream in that consciousness. Uh, that's how it is. Kind of deja vu. Deja vu and you know, kind of things like that. So. It kind of really intense for you when you wake up and it's just like, I'm here. Yeah. Like it's disappearing as yeah. you're trying to remember it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like maybe throughout the day when something happens and you're like, I'm here. Yeah. It's like, hmm? Yeah. It's for a while you remember it. Yeah. It's like a couple of minutes and you're like, yeah. For a while you can look yeah, at yeah. it a lot more quickly. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's not, it's something that I pretty much, you know, from the beginning didn't have a problem with, you know, um, and that it's not, I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. I'm just saying like, I was just like, yeah, sure. But I've always, um, nonetheless still investigated it. You know, it's like, I still think about it and I still try to like say like, okay, well, is that actually true? You know? Um, but at the end of the day, it, it's not like essential, you know, to, um, to all of this stuff. So, yeah, so it can be very helpful. You know, when we, we can increase our motivation, we can make it really vast because we can be like, hey, from now through all of my lifetimes in the future, I'm going to try to benefit all beings. You know, we can just we can have that as a motivation now. You know, and it's just easier if you believe it. You know, so. But again, it's not necessary. I'm just gonna check on the computer, see if anybody wrote anything or not. No. Does anybody have any ideas about what we should study uh, in week four? <laughs> yeah. What's the point of it all? What's the point of it all? Okay. What's the ultimate point? What's the point of it all? I don't know. <laughs> After you've attained the that's, that's the question. Then what? Well, again, um, you know, uh, that's a. That's a loaded term, attained, right? We're thinking about it as like, I've attained the thing that I wanted. I've, yeah, right, I've, um, I have. Um, Constant basic reality. Well, and it's, yeah, I mean, it's really beyond attaining anything. And there's, a, there's no other way to describe it except to get into all this like, um, it can maybe even sound like, uh, you know, cliched um, Yoda speak, you know? Um, Yoda! You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, um, because it is, it's beyond, it's beyond. It's beyond our ignorance. It's beyond our subject grasping. It's beyond, Gati Bodhisoha. This is what it is, yeah. Gone, gone, gone beyond, gone completely beyond Bodhisoha. And, and so it's, it's, it's just beyond drives beyond. us crazy. It drives our discursive minds because we want to, we want to know that answer. We want it to be an answer, a word or a We're always trying to find thing a or something <clears throat> that, that we have, that we can keep and then we put it in our pocket. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's said that, that there's Therefore, a, that's the answer to the question. <laughs> right. Right. So, so nobody knows. Yeah, yeah, so there is no point. And yet there is no no point. This is the only way <laughs> that you can like answer it, you know. So and then you're just like, ah. <laughs> thanks a lot, Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> yeah, even that? if you're on board with it, it still boggles your mind sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beyond comprehension. Beyond concepts. Yeah. yeah. Have you heard of biphasic thinking? Mm -mm. It's where you can hold two opposing concepts at the same time and both of them are true. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, I mean, that's a good exercise for sure, you know, because you, you got to get by, past this subject object grasping that's that's not true, it's just not how things are. Um, so we've got to get be beyond this idea of, uh, you know, this and that, me, self, and other, this kind of thing, this kind of experience, because it's just not how things are. So, but it's so hard. I have to wait it's so hard. That yeah. <laughs> So, but but everything, all all of uh, the teachings say you will know it when you found it. <laughs> and if you're not so sure, hard. if you're not sure, then you, you or if you think that you're you have, not there yet. if you think that you have, then you're not there yet. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank so you thanks too. for joining. See you next time. Yeah.